Good evening and welcome to this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. I'm Sheridan Lewis. This evening, Prime Minister Gonzales speaks to the API's director on his bid to sit on the United Nations Security Council as a non-permanent member. The restorative process of the Ashton Lagoon signals a new phase in ecotourism here. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs celebrates outstanding participants in the recent essay competition. These stories will follow Newswatch. Let's join the API's Nelly Cupid. Good evening, welcome to this edition of News Watch for Thursday, June 6th, 2019. I'm Nelly Skubid, thanks for joining us. Major Joanna Lewin, Project Officer from the Royal Commonwealth Ex-Services League, is currently in country to offer support to ex-service men and women who may have served in the British Royal Forces before this country's independence. Major Lowen will be working with the local Royal St. Vincent Legion of the RCEL. According to Major Lowen, support will be given to ex-service personnel and spouses. They have now negotiated some funds from an external source. It's still government, UK government for funds, but it's not from the RCEL, which is the Royal Commonwealth Ex-Services League, um, for, to, to bring up that amount so that it's a little bit more meaningful. It's supposed to be able to provide two meals a day at 2,400 calories for all the, not only World War II veterans and widows, but any local forces, that persons who served in a British armed force here or wherever in the Caribbean. So that's, the, that's one of the biggest differences. And the other good, benefit is that it is the widows who traditionally have received half of what the veterans receive are now going to be receiving the same amount. So those are the two significant differences. Um, and we are hoping that we can find some of the local forces who may now benefit when they probably would not have been eligible before. Major Lowen is encouraging the public to help in identifying ex-service men or women and spouses or their widows so that they can benefit from the program. And if anybody knows of anybody out there to contact the Legion and let them know so that we can see if they're eligible. The Ashton Lagoon recently underwent major restorative work. The first phase of the project was unveiled last Friday by the Sustainable Grenadines, Inc. Parliamentary representative for the Southern Grenadines, Honorable Terence Oliver, during his remarks at the unveiling of the Ashton Lagoon restoration project, highlighted a number of issues facing his constituency. Oliver addressed his concerns about Salt Whistle Bay in Myro as it is showing the effects of coastal erosion and degradation. Oliver also called for government to take steps to reduce taxes attached to airline tickets. He said that high taxes are a hindrance to visitors who wish to travel to the southern Grenadines. If we want to attract the type of tourists and visitors to this site, we must remember that the high taxes which are placed on travel must be removed because it is cheaper to travel from Barbados to Miami than it is to travel from Barbados to the Grenadines. And if we want to attract people here, then it must be affordable and access must be easy and quick. Minister of Finance and Sustainable Development, Honorable Camilo Gonzalez, acknowledged the concerns raised by Oliver. He directly addressed the reduction of airline taxes. We have to do things differently in Union Island because even though it's cheaper to fly to Miami from Barbados, they're not flying on Twin Otters. And if you wanted to fly a Twin Otter from Barbados to Miami, you'd see it cost a little bit more than flying a plane that holds 250 people who are all paying top dollar to fly there, an efficient machine. So getting people here is going to be different. Entertaining people when, once they're here is going to be different. Making sure that they spend money here is going to be different. Making sure that they don't damage the environment is going to be different. 
Re-energizing the spirit of the Indian people is the goal of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Indian Heritage Foundation. This was expressed by President of the Foundation, Junior Bacchus. Bacchus was at the time addressing the celebration of Indian Arrival Day on Sunday at the Raraku Recreational Grounds where the 158th anniversary of the arrival of the first indentured laborers to this country was recognized. We are here to advocate for the history and the recognition of the culture of the, for the people of Indian, East Indian descent. So we are simply promoting the culture that we were, that were taken away from us. Because you must recognize that on the arrival of the Indians here, they most came as Hindus, but they were converted to Catholics. The names were taken away, they were given all kinds of names. The register is done at the archives, and you could see the names given to the Indians there. They, they, their, their practices were taken away, but we are continuing now as a foundation to re re-energize the spirit of the Indian people. To mark this special occasion, seven outstanding Vincentians of Indian descent were honored for their contribution to development. The honorees are Hanif Sutherland, Pearlene Marx, Knox and Annalee Thomas, Anton Bowman, Noel Sullin, and Vibert Bailey. Also paying tribute at this festive occasion were members of the Indian dance group Namita of Suriname. Prime Minister Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez pointed out that the Indian civilization dates back some 6,000 years and this in itself shows a culturally rich society. Prime Minister Gonzalez stressed that India has become a powerful country and nation in their own right. When I met President Modi, I, uh, Prime Minister Modi, I told him that when I visited India many years ago, I stayed at the Ashoka Hotel. There are 25 Indian restaurants cooking food in 25 different ways. Indian food because of the different regions. He told me that in Gujarat, because he's Gujarati, he said, when I come to India, he has to let me go there. They had a, they had a food festival, he told me. We had 653 vegetarian dishes were on display. Different vegetarian dishes. Could you imagine that? You know, I, I, I want the people of St. Vincent and Grenadines who are listening to understand about this magnificent country called India and its people. This is an ancient civilization. It is absolutely amazing. Indian Arrival Day is commemorated in St. Vincent annually on June 1st. This is where we end News Watch for this evening. I'm Nelly Skipid. Thanks for joining us. The API presentation continues. Stay with us. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Welcome back. The API's director, Jennifer Richardson, discusses with Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez on his bid to represent this country as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Here's more. This evening, we'll be chatting about this country's bid to secure a seat as a non-permanent member to the United Nations Security Council. The United Nations Security Council has primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. It has 15 members, and each member has one vote. 
Under the Charter of the United Nations, all member states are obligated to comply with Council decisions. The Security Council takes lead in determining the existence of a threat to the peace or act of aggression. It calls upon the parties to, dis to a dispute to settle it by peaceful means and recommends the methods of adjustment or terms of settlement. In some cases, the Security Council can resort to imposing sanctions or even authorize the use of force to maintain or restore international peace and security. So, this is a very important organization. PM, in the scheme of things, why is this nation, our small nation, mm -hmm. trying to get elected to the United Nations Security Council? Well, thank you very much for having me. I just want to make one addition to your summary introduction about this organ of the United Nations, the Security Council. That although there are 15 members, five of them are permanent. And these five are United States of America, United Kingdom, France, the Russian Federation, and the People's Republic of China. Essentially the victorious countries after the Second World War. They're permanent and they have a veto power. They don't have a veto power on who goes on to the council as a non-permanent member. And the non-permanent members, they are in different regions of the world have different numbers of the for, for membership on the Security Council. For instance, Africa has three non-permanent members. Um, Asia has two. Western Europe and others, which includes Canada, they have two. Um, Asia Pacific has two. And the group of Latin America and the Caribbean, which is our region, 33 member states in this region, they have two members. Currently, their two members are the Dominican Republic and Peru. But Peru's term, two-year term, comes to an end on December the 31st. So that is the, that is the position that we are, in fact, um, vying for. So that we would be with the Dominican Republic if we are successful. But the Dominican Republic comes off at the end of 2020. But we will come off, if successful, at the end of 2021. So that's, that's basically the, 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 the structure, as you outlined the functions of the, the Security Council. Now, it is important for me to reiterate that the, though, the, though the permanent members have a veto on matters which come before the Council in relation to peace, security, and the like. For membership of the Security Council in respect of the non-permanent members, it's the General Assembly which decides, and the General Assembly decides on the basis of a two-thirds majority present and voting. There are 193 members of the General Assembly, you need 129, 130 to, to, to have the two-thirds um, of, the, of the, the, the General Assembly. So that is what we are going for. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have been endorsed by GRULAC, by the group of Latin America and the Caribbean, as the only candidate. But there have been situations where you, you may be, it's, it's possible for you to be not voted on, even though your group says yes, because you have to get two thirds. The group of Latin America and the Caribbean, we are just 33 
votes. So there's a, there's a lot to play for, so to speak. And as the baseball, people say in the United States, it's not over till it's over. And the companion saying, don't know where it came from. It's not over until the fat lady sings. <laughs> so so we, we wait to see what happens on Friday. Tell us a bit about the effort put into getting us where we are now with a possible election on June 7th. Well, the election's definitely taking place on June 7th, um, barring something unusual. The genesis of this run for the Security Council started 2008, when we were seeking to have a slot for 2010. And we were seeking to be the CARICOM candidate. And but Colombia was all, had come into the picture. And rather than have a contest with, Col with Colombia, though a number of our friends globally and certainly in the Caribbean thought that make the run, I took the decision for us not to make the run then. The time for campaigning was short and I applied my heart to wisdom and looked for a slot for 2020-2021. In short, therefore, we had an 11-year campaign for the slot for 2021, with the election take, taking place in June 2019. Um, we decided on this long campaign because we believe that ideas count. And we don't have a lot of resources to do the campaigning, but we have a lot of ideas. And we do a lot of work in the international system. We work certainly in, in, in the Grulac area, our area. We do very good work in CARICOM in the Association of Caribbean States, in the community of states of Latin America and the Caribbean, CELAC. We work very well in the African, Caribbean and Pacific group and the interaction with the European Union. We work in the non-aligned movement. We joined the non-aligned movement. We work in ALBA. Um, we work at the OAS which is a hemispheric body. Um, we work in multiple international organizations and people see the quality of our work. We are always very thoughtful. And even if you hold a position which is not in agreement with our position, we always set out a very thoughtful line of march, ground it in principles and make an assessment of the factual situation and apply, make the requisite applic uh, application with the law and the facts and come to a conclusion. Now, if you do that for a long period of time, people begin to say this country is a small country but this country has equality in thinking in addresses inter addressing international issues. And at the United Nations, we, we did a number of things. God, this, this run started with when Camilo was our permanent representative and he built upon the, the foundation laid by Margaret Ferrari, who was our first permanent representative at the United Nations under the ULP administration. And you take, I give examples. In, in 2009, there was a special high level meeting of the General Assembly 
on the global economic crisis. We're in the middle of it, and the United Nations addressed its mind. And of course, you have 190 odd members, different views, different areas. It's a complicated business. How could you arrive at a particular set of conclusions? And you have to have an outcome document. And the rich north, it was agreed at the UN that they will have a facilitator who would work along with one from the south, the developing south. And the north chose a very experienced Dutch ambassador. And the south chose Camilo. And they worked on the, on the outcome document. And, and they saw the quality of St. Vincent Grenadines' work. And then, of course, since Rhonda King is there, we have served on the Fifth Committee as the chair, as the chair of the Fifth Committee. The Fifth Committee deals with matters of budget and administration at the United Nations. Imagine St. Vincent and Grenadines chairing such an important committee. I mean, the Secretary General himself um, told me, current Secretary General, that, you know, he was so happy with the work of Rhonda, that she did excellent work and he wished that he could have her on a longer basis to chair the fifth committee. Of course, other countries have to come by and, and do, do chairing too. And then we are now the president of ECOSOC. ECOSOC is one the Economic and Social Council is one of the main organs of the United Nations. They're responsible, among other things, to oversee the implementation of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted in September 2015. All the countries in the world signed on. Um, and, and, and she's doing fantastic work there. I mean, the profile of St. Vincent and Grenadines is quite, is quite high at the United Nations. There are other things too, small arms, we, our work in climate change with the Association of Small Island States, with SIDS DOC, Small Island Developing States DOC, DOC meaning a docking station, looking for resources and so on. So, tremendous work. Okay, so having done all of that work, how confident are you that we, St. Vincent and Grenadines, will be elected as a non permanent member to the Security Council, and if we are elected, what are some of the benefits to be gained okay. for this country? Well, first of all, we have had, as I say, a campaign based on ideas. What are the central ideas? The central ideas are laid out in the chart of the United Nations non-interference in the internal affairs of a, a country, um, defense of independence and sovereignty, equality of states, peaceful settlement of disputes, a commitment to international law. All these things are very critical. You ask the question, what would it benefit St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Look, we are a responsible member of the international community. It is in our interest to see international law prevail. When you, when you are involved in, in your own, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, when you support the rule of law, you support the rule of law because you know that is important for your security. For a small country, international law is very important. Peace and security, they're very important. You can't develop, we can't deal with our challenges of, uh, of poverty, the, the legacy of underdevelopment of, uh, uh, of native genocide, African slavery, colonialism and imperialism, without we live in peace and security. And when 
problems occur, let us say, in the Middle East, what happens? The price of oil goes up. So it's our interest in material terms, in life, living, and work and production, that we have peace and security. Caribbean is a zone of peace. There are a lot of environmental challenges we have. I mean, nuclear waste passing through the Caribbean. That's a security issue. It's an environmental issue, but it's a security issue also. So there, there, there is a, there's a multiplicity of matters touching and concerning the role of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the global political economy, in the global system of international relations that we have a perspective on and as a small island developing state we have a very clear perspective on them and we would like to offer that perspective at the Security Council for these two years. Now the last time St. Vincent, the last time a Caribbean country sat on the Security Council was Jamaica uh, at the turn of the 20th, the 21st century, 20, 20, 20, 2000, 2001. So it's 20 years. Before that, Trinidad and Guyana sat. But the heyday of these countries sitting, the, the heyday of Eric Williams and Forbes Burnham, and Michael Manley, P.J. Patterson. St. Vincent and Grenadines, we thought that we should take up this mantle in the same way we took it up for ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council, on which we sit now. We are the third country from the Caribbean ever since the founding of the United Nations in 1945 to, be the, to hold the presidency of ECOSOC. Um, and we're doing a very good job. It's acknowledged in, in the United Nations that we are doing a very good job. And um, the two countries before was Jamaica, who did it after 30 odd years uh, of the ECOSOC's existence since 1947, and then Haiti about 10 years after that. And then we. And we, 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 we want to see Caribbean countries being involved more and more so that over the past 20 years, only the Latin countries were offering themselves to the seat of, 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 on ECOSOC from the Grulac region, from the group of Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, when we began this thrust towards this quest for, this, to, for membership on the Security Council, non-permanent member status, some people in our country were saying, where Ralph is going with that? I mean, this is an impossible quest. Um, everybody here, St. Vincent Grenadines, could sit down with the United States of America and Russia and China and France and Britain to talk about peace and security in the world? And my response is, why not? We have a perspective. And uh, some people didn't even understand what we were doing. There were negative things that, oh, they're wasting the time because they don't have relations with the People's Republic of China, diplomatic relations, and therefore the PRC will veto them. Nobody has a vote, a veto on this question. All you have to get two-thirds of the General Assembly. Um, and we just simply persisted and we just continued. Some people said, well, you know, Ralph was doing that for the purpose of, first of all, election in 2010. Well, I showed them that that is not the case. <laughs> it was not the case for election in 2015. I didn't know I was going to be re-elected in 2010 or 2015. And, and uh, so that, 
I was doing, I, I, we, ha, we have been doing this for the nation of St. Vincent and the Grandines. You know the impact of this on people in St. Vincent and the Grandines all around the world. The question of the prestige, you know, <laughs> to see our young diplomats sitting down there offering their perspectives. On, on the important matters affecting the world. And you, you, you pan it on CNN or, or Fox or MSNBC or whichever, or BBC, and you see these, you say, wait, does that young man from Liu or that young woman from Georgetown or Mespo, wait, that's in Vincent Grandis. And this is our 40th year of independence. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I'm, I'm not looking at this matter in a transactional sense as to economic benefits which will come to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. No, 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 no. I'm addressing this thing in a large sense of contributing to the maintenance, to the promotion, of peace and security in the world and to be in a position to reaffirm our support for bedrock principles laid down in the chart of the United Nations. But PM, um, it is clear that our election to the Security Council would lift the status of St. Vincent globally and it is also clear that given the number of other organizations within the UN that this country has served on and is serving on, that the voice of St. Vincent, never mind our size, is being heard. Absolutely. And taken seriously. Absolutely. Now, if we fail in our bid to secure the non permanent seat, what would you say would have been some of the gains on the way there up to that point? Well, the, 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 the point is this. We have been endorsed by CARICOM, mm -hmm. we have been endorsed by GRULAC, and we have received letters of confirmation of, for support of dozens of countries all over the world. And uh, I am optimistic that um, on the on on Friday the seventh, that we will we will get the two thirds majority. I'm I'm optimistic. In fact, I'm going up on Wednesday. Um, Wednesday the fifth, on the evening of the sixth, there there are some countries which we we are going to have, which are going for their respective regions where we are going to have a, a an event um, in a sense rallying our support and on Friday on Thursday I have a number of meetings with important countries I should point this out people people said to me um, do we, do you know how the, the P5, the permanent five, how are they voting? What, where are they throwing their weight? Are they throwing their weight behind you? I'm talking about the United States of America, United Kingdom, France, the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China. And the P5, the permanent five, they don't ever tell you whether they are going to vote for you or not. Because that's a, an unwritten rule among them. But as you know, we have engaged the, the P5, and we do engage them over the years. In the case of the People's Republic of China, we 
with which we do not have diplomatic relations. We work with them in the non-aligned movement. We work with them in the G77 and China. In our own region, we are members of the Caribbean Development Bank. And you notice that always, that I say nothing of a negative nature of the People's Republic of China. We have diplomatic relations with, with Taiwan, and um, that's a long-standing relationship. And we have explained our position. And I think, I think the PRC understands our position. And they, they see how we function in a principled manner. And they know that from the leader all the way down in the, in the cabinet, to all members of the cabinet and in the government and among the people, we have tremendous respect. And we are in awe of the achievements of the Chinese civilization, whatever the political expression of, of that civilization. I, I would say this, the, for persons who say, well, uh, countries, you know, get their turn to sit on the Security Council, how is it that there are 60 countries who never, of the General Assembly, 60 countries in the world which, which never sat on the Security Council? 60. It's a big number. Number will be reduced by one. And you're con very confident <laughs> of that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the, look, there are many things which we are told we can't do. We can't implement the education revolution. We can't build a bridge over Rabaka. We can't build an international airport. We can't do geothermal. These things are said are beyond us. All of them large strategic issues. <laughs> At first they said we can't um, get on to the Security Council. Look, at first, when we began in 2008, even within the Caribbean, there are some countries which were skeptical. But bit by bit, day by day, sweet Jesus, um, they see what this little country is about and what the government is about. PM, that is a good note on which to end. I want to take the opportunity to wish you safe travels to New York and trust that our bid to become a member of this Security Council, non permanent member, is successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have been listening to an interview with Prime Minister Dr. Rav Gonzalez as we look forward to Friday, June 7th, when this country will know for sure if it makes history by becoming the smallest nation ever elected as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Sustainable Grenadines Inc. unveils restorative project at the Ashton Lagoon. Stay with us. More on this when we return. Marine and Coastal Rehabilitation Adaptation Project. Located south of the island, extending to over five bays, White Sands, Kanash, Kaliakwa, Villa, and Indian Bay. Let's improve aquatic life. A message from the National Parks, Rivers, and Beaches Authority and partners. Thanks for staying with us. After major restoration activities, Sustainable Grenadines Inc. Susgren unveiled the restoration project at the Ashton Lagoon. The lagoon area is home to a mangrove ecosystem, which is an ideal habitat for many species of fish and an important nesting site for shorebirds and migratory species. 
Executive Director of Susgreen, Orisha Joseph, said that the people of Union Island are proud of the Ashton Lagoon and hoped they will continue to work with Susgreen to maintain the area. She acknowledged the support of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, regional and international partners who supported the lagoon restoration. Kesha Woodley tells us more. I'm excited. I'm happy. It's a super califragilistic espiali doshas day to be in the Grenadines and to be on Union Island. We are here for the unveiling of the Ashton Lagoon Restoration Project and the closing out of the CMBP project. The Executive Director of Sustainable Grenadines, Inc., Susgren, Orisha Joseph, has every cause to be excited with the work thus far on the Ashton Lagoon Restoration Project. Ashton Lagoon is located on the southern coast of Union Island, which is in the southern Grenadines between St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Grenada. The offshore frigate island, which once stood alone, is now connected to Union Island by the constructed causeway. The excitement in the air was tangible. Chairperson of Susgren, Katrina Collins Coy, delivered the opening prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for this blessing of today. The beautiful sunshine, although the people is praying for rain, but I guarantee in the name of Jesus, after all has been said and done today, we will get showers of blessing to top it off and give glory to your name. Executive Director of Susgren, Orisha Joseph, said that 25 years ago, the Ashton Lagoon was the chosen spot for a marina. However, that project was aborted. In 2007, Joseph stated that the community came to Susgren asking for help to restore the area. It has been an area that families and friends will come to picnic, have a good time, and swim. I remember in 2016, when we were not too far from here, actually launching the Ashton Lagoon project, um, the director of Grenadine Affairs, um, Edwin Snag, was saying, I remember when I was a little boy picking up conks and lobster and all of that. And with that aim was to restore and to bring back that area to the place um, it once used to be. Joseph highlighted major activities involved in the restoration. Restoration included the creation of breaches in the causeway to allow the reintroduction of the flow of fresh seawater into the lagoon and the creation of swales allowing water exchanges between the mangrove forest and the open ocean. We created seven gaps there. The first was funded by the Philip Stevenson Foundation and the last two was funded by the KFW through five C's. 
um, I really want to recognize those um, agencies who stood by us and contributed those funds along with USAID, Jeff, Birds Caribbean, and TNC, because they really stood by us, believed in us, and that is why we had the funds to continue with the restoration. In addition to that, I think one of the major features is the bridge. Um, when we were building that over the water bridge, people were like, ah, I think, I don't know how that will look. But I remember when we completed construction and people started to visit the area, when we posted up the first picture, it got 20,000 likes in less than 24 hours. Also, to say that we did some mangrove restoration to replant some red mangroves as part of our conservation efforts here. According to Joseph, they have statistics to show that since January of 2019, there has been over 700 local visitors to the lagoon. International or foreign visitors, we had 356. We have 504 kite surfers between January to date and 345 yachts visiting Frigate Island from zero to that figure, I think that is a success in itself. And this is not only Susgren, this is Union Island, this is yours, this is the Grenadines, and the people of Union Island are very proud of this area. And I just want to continue to admonish you to take care of this area, it is your area, it is the Grenadines, it's all about one people, and we should be proud of this accomplishment. Joseph used the opportunity to say thanks to some of the people who have been in the trenches with Susgren and are now here to share in the success. And one of them is Lisa Sorensen. Could you please stand? Lisa Sorensen has been with this project since 2007 of Birds Caribbean. And while Lisa is standing, Louise also remains standing because Louise also um, helped us really push forward to get approval so that we could see this day. Also, Mr. Martin Barito, who was working in the past on this project along with the rest of the board members I really want to thank them and also the person that really um, you know sent it home is Honorable Saboto Caesar when he presented to cabinet and we got the home run to implement that project Master of Ceremonies and Fisheries Coordinator Edwin Andrews specially mentioned several donors who partnered with Susgreen. And these include German Development Bank, KFW, administered by the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, commonly known as Five Cs, the Philip Stevenson Foundation, administered by the Nature Conservancy, the Grenadines Partnership Fund, administered by the Nature Conservancy, a Global Environmental Facility, a Small Grants Program, Jeff. Uh, the United States Agency for International Development through the Caribbean Marine Devi Biodiversity Program, USAID, CMBP Program. The official unveiling of the Ashton Lagoon Restoration Project had support from the government of Grenada in the persons of Honorable Kendra Maturin Stewart, Minister for Caracou and Pity Martinic Affairs and Local Government, and Permanent Secretary in the said ministry, Ms. Rolda Comina. Minister Maturin Stewart worked closely with Susgren on the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and the Nature Conservancy Caribbean Marine Biodiversity Program, CMBP-funded project. The aim of the CMBP was to support the commitment made by Grenada and St. Vincent and the Grenadines to protect at least 20% of their marine and coastal areas by 2020 as part of the Caribbean Challenge Initiative.
the Union Island Cultural Conquerors added to the excitement with a dance to a very fitting song. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I am Keisha Woodley. Coming up, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce hosts prize-giving ceremony for outstanding participants in its annual essay writing competition. Stay with us. A lot goes into shaping an individual, but it all starts here. What may seem to us like simple fun is critical to their education and overall development. It's how they start to define and understand the speech, how they develop their motor skills and hand-eye coordination. Remember, children are never too young to learn. This message was brought to you by the UNICEF Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, the Caribbean Child Support Initiative, and this station. Thanks for staying with us. A number of young people from schools across St. Vincent and the Grenadines participated this year in the annual essay writing competition of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce. A prize-giving ceremony was held on the 31st of May to award those who came out on top. Shana Daniel was there and tells us more in the following report. Participants, teachers and proud parents packed the conference room of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce to witness the prize-giving and awards ceremony of the Ministry's annual essay competition. Permanent Secretary Sandy Peters Phillips congratulated the students and gave an overview of the competition. I would like to convey congratulations to every student here this morning. This year, our topics touch on several issues related to trade, bilateral, regional, and multilateral diplomacy, as well as consular affairs. The topics were as follows in the Envoys category. One, what are the benefits of social media to business and trade development? Two, a day in the life, imagine that you are your country's foreign minister for a day. Which countries would you build a relationship with and why? And three, an essential document for travel is the passport. Explain why is it necessary to have a passport. In the ambassador's category, the essays were, one, CSME, is it working? Two, in your view, how can the alliance of small island states develop strategic action plans to address the future of climate change within small island developing states such as St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And three, Vincentian citizenship cannot be bought or sold. Undoubtedly, these topics would have required a lot of research from our students. Additionally, we wish to commend our envoys and ambassadors for representing their various schools. The ministry trusts that your writing skills and the knowledge of the current affairs have been considerably boosted as, your, as you build your confidence in developing your academic portfolios. And Minister with Responsibility for Youth, the Honorable Frederick Stevenson, commended the students who participated in the competition and all those who assisted them. I observed that a lot of research was put into, into your work and I commend you very highly. I want also to, to, to thank the teachers and who assisted in one way or the other and uh, also for the support given by your parents and your, your peers, your friends. In the Envoys category, Ajani Daya emerged the winner with her winning essay on the topic 
Benefits of Social Media to Business and Trade Development Social media helps businesses to build a real relationships with their customers. Some people may argue that social media allows bad marks to spread quickly. However, businesses can use this to correct mistakes and help their customers. This will also support customer loyalty. And in the ambassador's category of the competition, Milan Compton came out on top with her winning essay titled, Vincentian Citizenship Cannot Be Bought or Sold. Citizenship is not by race or culture, and hopefully it will never be by wealth. It is by both, me neighbor string very right here. Descent, me mama or papa neighbor string very right here. Marriage, for me husband and wife neighbor string very here. Or registration, me foot them properly plant here and me wish me neighbor string being very right here too. To be totally honest, the real reason we should never put a price on our citizenship is because a neighbor string will always be priceless. Senior Foreign Service Officer at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Tamira Brown, said all of the participants did an excellent job and would benefit greatly from the experience. Overall, I want to commend all of our students for their efforts this year. It is really commendable. And I thought about whether or not I would have participated in competitions like this in my time in secondary school or primary school. Yes, I would have had the parents to encourage me and nurture me along these lines. And you should continue to participate. As was said by Mrs. Williams earlier, do not walk away from here feeling that you have not won a prize. You have won the ultimate prize based on the experience that you have gotten by participating in this essay competition, whether it is the knowledge that you have gained or generally the feedback that would be given on your essays. The Foreign Affairs Annual Essay Competition receives sponsorship from telecommunications company Digicel. While Digicel, yes, we play a part in this, it is such a pleasure for us to help fuel what is really important work that is already being done. We are simply an amplifier for what you are doing. All entrants received certificates of participation and the first, second and third place winners received trophies and cash prizes. For the API, I am Shana Daniel reporting. We've come to the end of the API's presentation. Join us again on Saturday for Inside Story. For recaps and further updates, visit our social media platforms. On behalf of the API production team, thank you for viewing. I'm Sheridan Lois. Good night.